Yeah. Okay. Is this like Thanksgiving holiday clearing out? Everybody's already going on vacation? Probably. Yeah. Once it's going to be pretty empty. Well. Oh, it's still getting recorded and posted online either way. But, uh, okay. So homeworks are due tomorrow. How's the, uh, if, you, if you're going to be gone for the holiday, feel free to turn it in today or into the box. Um, how is the DIC lab going for those who have started it? Okay. Yeah. We're expecting like somewhere in the 30 to 60% error range. Um. <laughs> okay. So, uh, Pr Praveen is the one to talk to about error because he had, he's gone through and at least done the analysis on his end, and so he should know about like orders of magnitude error percent error uh, or bulk error percent error. Yeah. Yeah, he should be. I forget what day his office hours are. I think it's. Maybe it's today, maybe Wednesday. Yeah. Um, let's see. Okay. So uh, today we're going to talk about or finish up uh, some of the stuff on fracture mechanics. And then tomorrow we're going to show or we're going to talk about the application of fracture mechanics, which is to Weibull statistics. Um, next week, Monday, Tuesday, we'll be talking about fatigue, uh, which is an appropriate concept for the last week of class. Wednesday, we'll have a final review, and then Friday, we'll have our final or second midterm, effectively. Um, and then the lab is due that Thursday. Any questions or concerns before we get started? Cool. All right. So. We've been talking about fracture mechanics. Uh, we had found that there, the strength of a material is now dependent on the size of the flaws that are inside of it. So we can say uh, there's some, the, the stress that a material fails at and the size of some internal flaw is equal to a constant. Uh, so we relate this term now to uh, stress intensity factor for cracks in a material, where here, remember this is, this A is now the size of a crack in a material. We relate this to a stress intensity factor, Ki is equal to some constant depending on the geometry, sigma naught square root of pi A, because that's convenient. Um, and we can relate that stress intensity based on the, the Griffith and Irwin criteria um, to a critical energy or to an energy release rate where we can say now that Ki uh, is equal to G square root of EG. There we go. Where now we have this is stress intensity. Intensity and this is energy release rate. And I noted that this was an E star, and I'll show you why now. So uh, I now the, the strength that a material, or the, the fracture toughness of a material, um, or the fracture energy of a material, uh, are material parameters. So there's some KIC where materials will fail at, and we can say that material will fail at, um, at this is now a material parameter, material property. And we can say if there's a certain stress in that material or uh, for a given flaw size or a large enough flaw for a given stress, it'll cause failure. There's also a critical energy release rate, GC, that's related to that KIC. And I had shown the, the Ashby plot of how those two relate to each other. So GC is kind of uh, a little bit, in my mind, more intuitive. It's the, the terribility of the material, how much energy it takes to cause fracture to happen, whereas KIC is the, the stress that it takes to cause a flaw to propagate. Um, so now uh, there was one thing I wanted to define really quick before uh, getting into the stress field around a flaw. So. Uh, 
uh, that's factor of safety for a crack. Factor of safety. So now we had defined before the factor of safety, some factor of safety for a ductile material is the, the yield strength uh, over the maximum strength over sigma max depending on uh, or sigma equivalent where this depends on on material failure criteria criterion so this could be the von Mises or Tresca or just the maximum principal stress depending on whether we have a ductile or a brittle material um, I can define now a factor of safety for uh, for the fracture toughness of a material. So now we know that for for a certain stress or a certain flaw size, that the that sure will happen if I'm above that or above or below that KIC value, and so I can define a, a fracture factor of safety, um, which I'm going to call factor of safety uh, F or um, X. F, which is going to be the KIC, so that critical stress intensity divided by the KI. So it's the ratio now between uh, what KI I will fail at and what the actual KI is in the material, uh, which I could rewrite as KIC over uh, Y sigma naught square root of pi A. And so now this is a, a new definition of factor of safety for uh, if I have a certain far field stress and a certain flaw size and I know what the fracture toughness of my material is, I know how safe it is relative to the, to the fracture toughness of the material. Um, I can also define a factor of safety or a, a, a factor of safety for how big of a flaw I can have in a material. So I'm going to call this FOSA or um, XA, which is the A critical, so the critical flaw size that failure will nucleate, or that, uh, that stress a flaw will nucleate, versus the actual A in the material. So I can say that the maximum flaw in the material. Put this up, uh, which is I had shown yesterday 1 over pi KIC over sigma naught squared now divided by A. There we go. So I have a couple different new a couple new definitions of factor of safety now in terms of the fracture of the material. So now I know if I have a certain stress applied to the material with a certain flaw size, um, I know how much stress I can apply relative to my fracture toughness before fracture will start. Or if I know how much stress is there in the part, I know how big of a flaw I can have or how how close my flaw is to, to something that will cause fracture. Um, so these are another couple useful definitions. So now I want to get into the stress field around a crack tip and then how and why that starts to break down depending on plastic formation around the tip. So let's look at stress field around a crack. So here now, I'm going to go back to my definition of stress in polar coordinates. So I'm going to say, if I have some sort of a flaw, there's going to be some rounded edge there. I'm going to look now from the tip of that flaw, and I'm going to define now my x direction and a y direction. So there's a y direction here and an x direction here. And I'm going to be looking, oh, never mind, I have it in terms of x and y. Uh, I'm going to be looking at Cartesian coordinates, just kidding. Uh, I'm going to be looking at the stress at some point away. Uh, and I'm going to be looking at the shear and axial stresses now. Where here I have sigma x, sigma y, uh, and sigma xy. Uh, 
so the, the stresses in Cartesian coordinates. And I'm going to define now, so to find the actual stress around a crack tip, you can use a similar type of method to what we, what I, what I didn't show for the hole around the crack, uh, which is an Harry stress function. Um, stress function, uh, which you don't need to worry about using it all or how this derivation works, uh, but if you ever go into a, a higher, uh, another level up solid mechanics class or a grad level fracture class, then this is something you might actually do, is this derivation. Um, but if you go through, use this type of methodology, you can figure out what the stresses are kind of arbitrarily around the crack. Uh, and I'm going to show you now, so now d depending on the boundary conditions, uh, whether we're applying a far field tensile or shear or uh, mode three stress, it's going to affect what the stress field is. So I'm going to show you the stress for a mode one crack. So stress for mode one, which is again that far field uh, tension, that far field pulling. Uh, what we end up with is for stresses, we have sigma x in terms of ki, it's one over square root of two pi r uh, cosine of theta over two, one minus sine theta over two, sine of three theta over two, and then plus here now higher order terms. So the actual solution ends up with something uh, now on the order of r to the one half plus something on the order of r to the three halves plus a whole bunch of other stuff. But the important thing to look at here is this one over r term in the bottom. So now I'm defining, I'm defining this in Cartesian stress, in terms of a Cartesian stress, but I'm looking at this um, in terms of an r and theta away from my center point. Here, this r term now uh, means that as I go with crack, that one over square root of r means I'm gonna have an exponential increase uh, in stress near the crack. So around that crack now, if I'm looking at my r and the stress sigma x, I'm gonna have something that looks like that. So there's, there's an asymptote here at, at zero where this one over square root r is gonna cause that stress to blow up. And this is assuming an infinitely sharp crack. So in practice, this isn't necessarily what we'll see, but um, this type of stress field is, is what we assume for linear elastic fracture mechanics. So if there's no plastic deformation around the crack, if we have everything deforming linear elastically, this is the type of stress field that you would observe. And so this actually, if you remember now, uh, in that D, uh, the DIC I showed for the for the crack getting pulled, you saw that characteristic kind of butterfly shape. That butterfly shape comes from this term here. So there's a very high stress at the at the at the root of the crack, um, and then these cosine and sine terms add to that to that extra stress field around there. Um, we can write out similar expressions now for the stress in the other direction. They all have this one over square root of two pi r here. Uh, this is a cosine of theta over two. This is a one plus sine theta over two, sine three theta over two, plus some higher order terms. And then sigma xy similarly has some ki over square root two pi r. Sorry, there we go. Square so two pi r. Uh, this is now cosine theta over two, sine theta over two, sine of three theta over two, plus more higher order terms. So if you ever look now at the stress around that crack tip, this solution is is why you see the distribution you have, and so these terms will start to change depending on what that far field applied stress is. And so it turns out the maximum stress here uh, ends up being 
there at the center and kind of along this line um, where there are other stresses um, there are other high stresses kind of in some shape around there but the highest stress exists right here along the center of the crack and so this is why when we pull a sheet with a crack in it we get that crack to propagate through but for example when we when we did that um, when we did that to mo the mode 2 shear this highest stress now then exists at a 45 degree angle instead so I'm not going to write out what the solution is there's there's some big long ugly solution for these things but um, that solution uh, to this to the stress field is why cracks propagate in certain directions so now the there's one stress direction that I'm leaving out and that's the stress in the ex in the in the through direction so sigma z now can be one of two things depending on whether we have a thin or a thick plate and so this is why I, I've been writing that e star value so we talked about it like very briefly in class um, the difference between plane stress and plane strain uh, I talked about it I I'd given a little bit more info in the lecture notes but now if I have a thin plate I drew that better than I expected. Um, if I have a thin plate versus a thick plate that uh, with a crack along that edge. Uh, oh, crack there. Something like that. Crack in here. something like that. So now if I have a thin plate here, I have a plane stress condition, or a, yeah, plane stress condition, because these free boundaries on the side of the plate mean that the stress in the x direction can't really develop, or the stress in the, in the through direction can't really develop. So this is relevant for, say, a piece of paper. Um, when, I, when I pull on this, now the, the strain would give rise to some stresses, but because there's there's a free boundary here, there's really no stress in that through direction. So I have I, my stress in the through direction would be zero for plane stress. Plane. Yes. Sorry. There we go. For plane stress, um, which is for a thin plate. And then if it's not a thin plate, I have some minus nu sigma xx plus sigma yy for my plane strain. So this plane stress, my, my sigma z is zero for a plane strain, strain my, uh, my epsilon zz is zero. So it turns out that when you have this extra stress component, when you have this uh, extra z term, it reduces somewhat the the fracture required or the the stress required to cause fracture to propagate in a material. So now, if I look at that, uh, before I I had given you a KIC is that square root of e g e star g. Now I'm going to split these KIC into a plane stress and plane strain, where this is square root of EG, uh, critical, critical, where this is the Young's modulus, Young's modulus for plane strain, or plane stress, stress, and this is square root of EG over one minus nu squared for plane strain. So that E star here is 
either e or e divided by 1 minus nu squared for plane stress or plane strain. Is the 1 minus nu squared term inside the radical? Yes. Sorry. It goes all the way down. Stress. Strain. So, <coughs> the reason this happened, or what, what you can imagine now uh, happening experimentally when you start pulling on these types of materials is around the tip of this crack, uh, you'll actually start getting, so, so for, uh, for a plane stress condition, there's no stress in this through direction. And what'll actually happen at the tip of the crack is the material will start to contract in. So you'll end up with a negative strain and it'll get to deform in at that center point. And that inward deformation gives it a little bit more motion. Um, but for this fat material, it's not able to deform in. This extra stress component uh, reduces the, so, so it effectively increases the total stress, the hydrostatic stress in the material. And in this fracture process zone near the tip, what you'll actually end up with, um, you'll, you'll get a hydrostatic stress starting to build up and you'll start getting the formation of these voids internally. So this is the same type of process that happens actually during a tension test. And this is happening, uh, generally what happens for, for uh, metals during fracture processes is there's some grain structure in internal pre-existing voids, pre-existing cracks, something that when you start applying that, uh, that tensile stress, uh, those will, voids and cracks will start to grow and they'll start to nucleate. And so eventually the growth of those voids, the of those voids and cracks will cause this, the, the cause of fracture. So these cracks and voids will eventually start to split the material. Um, and so in a ductile metal, for example, when you, the reason you see that jagged fracture surface is because you have a stochastic formation of voids in that, in that gauge region, in the, in the area of that high tensile stress. So it starts to neck, you get a much higher stress localized in that region. And then in that gate, in that necking area, that high stress, you get kind of randomly voids will start to pop up. And then depending on how ductile it is, you'll get more and more voids forming it further, further away from the gauge, and you'll get a rougher and rougher surface. Um, it's also affected by the, not only the grain structure of the material, but the alloy composition, any precipitates, any, the, the, uh, the flaw structure initially, it's, it's a really complicated process. And so anytime you have, uh, if, if you were to do like a material science investigation of a fracture surface, what you want is after, uh, immediately after you pull that part up, uh, you, you pull those things apart, you would want to kind of preserve that surface and take that to an SEM, an image, uh, what, what that fracture surface looks like, because that's gonna tell you about how the material is failing. Um, cool. So now for fracture tests, actually, generally when uh, engineers define this value of KIC, they do it, they, they want you to do a test in a plain strain condition, because this is actually going to be a, a slightly lower KIC. So this is a conservative uh, fracture test, a more conservative fracture test than 4.8. So generally, for fracture specimens, you want a fairly thick plate. Um, yeah. Thicker plate. Yeah. So basically, we're saying for a thicker plate that epsilon in like the thickness direction is like zero. So it's so a transverse, as in x and y, a transverse stress causes a through stress. Is that what's happening? Because like the sigma z z is a function of sigma x x and sigma y y. Mm -hmm. That means a through stress is caused by the transverse stresses. Yes, yeah. So this, uh, because this sigma z term is zero, you can uh, figure out what the strains are and relate that back to stresses. So I think in uh, somewhere in, I think section three point something of the notes, I talk a little bit more in depth about plane stress and plane strain. I didn't go through it a lot in class, um, but I did type it up in the notes.
so that might help clarify things reading through that yeah uh, but yeah so it, it does end up causing a this this plane strain condition does end up causing a, a through direction stress to develop cool so questions so far Maybe, maybe not. All right. So now, what I what I really want to say now, what I experimentally, uh, what I really want to find out is what the stress is exactly at the tip of the crack. So here in these stress equations, I have this one over square root of R term. Theoretically, I would have an infinite stress. I know for a ductile material, that's not practical. There's always going to be some sort of plasticity mechanisms um, happening in a material. No matter, even if, even if it is a brittle material, there's going to be some atomic scale deformation. Uh, and for a ductile material, there'll be a whole lot of deformation. So what I want to say now is, is when these conditions are valid. So the way that we're defining uh, these equations and these uh, failure criteria so these stress equations and these failure criteria is a, that there's some infinite stress at the crack. So this is what's known as our, our linear elastic fracture mechanics, or LEFM. And so in order to perform a valid fracture test, we need these relationships to hold in order to get a valid... To get a val so in order for those relations to hold, we need to look at what's happening around the tip of the crack. And when we do that, I had showed this... Um, uh, I think on the first day when I was talking about uh, Irwin's stress criteria, but um, now I want to see when is linear elastic fracture mechanics mechanics valid. So this is L E F M. So, um, to do that, let's take a closer look now around the tip of a crack. Before I had showed here and now at some R, uh, I have the stress in the material is approaching some infinite value, going up and then decaying, and this had a 1 over square root R dependence. So it's that 1 over square root R is what's going to give rise to this curve, but experimentally I know somewhere in this zone around the tip of the crack there's some plastic deformation processes. So I had showed for, for metals this is that dislocation motion and grain boundary sliding. For polymers it's the polymer chain sliding and crazing. Uh, it could be micro cracking in a ceramic. Um, but so in this zone actually uh, this is now my, what I'm going to call my fracture process zone. Or my, my plastic zone. So I have some plasticity processes happening in this region. And so what actually happens is my stress will start to plateau in that area around whatever the yield strength of my material is. So I'll get, I'm not going to get that infinite stress. I'm actually going to have some uh, potentially hardening, but uh, some much lower stress at the, the yield stress of my material. And this yield stress is actually generally the closer to the theoretical yield strength of the material because it's at such a, uh, especially for brittle materials, because it's so localized. Um, so past that, I have some... Uh, some region where this is approximately valid, where this line approximately follows things, and then eventually it'll it'll drop off. Um, so I have here now. Uh, I'm going to call this my my k annulus, annulus, or a k dominant zone. So this is where that. Um, 
this field, this stress field is, is approximately valid, where my, my linear elastic solution is approximately valid. And then outside of this, I have some uh, boundary condition dominated region. where eventually the stress will drop off. And say if I, if I have a crack in a piece of paper and I start pulling it around the tip of that crack, let's, let's draw a crack. If I have a crack now in the material and I start pulling on that crack, I may have um, some small area around that where this is valid, uh, where, where I have some plasticity, some region here where that K annulus is valid, where that K field is valid, and then some region all the way over here where it starts to drop off because I have a free surface there, so the, my material isn't infinite, and that derivation is made for a, a small crack in a semi-infinite material. So we need to find now what the size of this fracture process zone is so we can figure out when I can use that linear elastic fracture theory to actually measure a fracture toughness of a material. So what I want to find out now, if I say this uh, fracture process zone has some size RP. So RP now is the radius of my plastic zone. I want to figure out what that plastic zone size is. So let's erase my crack. Zone size. And now I want to find out what the size of my plastic zone in the material is. So I can approximate this now. I know um, I know my the stress in the material is proportional to that Ki over square root of two pi r. So from from these equations, I have all these stresses have some K over two pi r term out in front. So I know stress is approximately that. So I can find out. Uh, if I if I, I want to find out the area or the region where this is the yield strength, so I have to find out how far this R goes. So I can say the size of the plastic zone now, I can rearrange this, bring the R over to the other side, bring the K over, and I can say the size of my plastic zone, RP, is approximately equal to uh, 1 over 2 pi Ki over sigma y, Kic over sigma y squared. Um, so now I can use this term as a, as a very rough metric for figuring out how big this is going to be and how big my how big of a part I have to make specifically to actually perform a valid fracture test. Um, and by valid fracture test, technically there's fracture processes going on no matter how big my part is, but what I want to do is in measuring this KIC value I want to use that linear elastic fracture theory, and to do so I have to say that this RP is small relative to the part size. So in order to perform a valid fracture test, or for valid fracture tests, I need RP is much smaller than the part size. So for example, let's now plug some values for this in and figure out how big that fracture process zone might be for different materials. So let's look first, an example of glass. So for glass, one over two pi is a constant. I had given you that KIC value, which was something on the order of one MPA root meter. And I know the yield strength now uh, because this is going to be uh, happening in a very small zone and it's, uh, I'm trying to find it around cracks, I'm actually going to be using the theoretical strength of the material. So the theoretical strength of the material is around 10 gigapascals um, because I'm saying there's no other cracks in the material. So here, if I plug some stuff in, that RP is 1 over 2 pi, I have 1 over... 10, uh, 10 to the 3, 10 times 10 to the 3, so 10 to the 4th MPA root meter, 10 to the 4th 
MPA squared. So this ends up being something on the order of 10 to the minus 9 meters, or about 1 nanometer. So now, pretty much for glass, I can make any size part and I can perform a valid fracture test. So any size part gives valid LEFM. So long as my part isn't, say, three nanometers across, um, then I, I'm going to be able to perform a valid test. So that's why, because glass is so brittle, I, I don't need it to be very big. Um, because because of this large dis anisotropy or this large uh, difference between KIC and sigma y, but if I don't have uh, a, as ductile of a material, so let's say I'm working with a steel now, so let's look at high strength steel. Steel and let's say this has, um, so I'm gonna throw a, a something at you right now. The So for most metals, there's an inverse correlation between strength and toughness. Um, and so the stronger you make a material, generally the lower the fracture toughness is. That's not to say that you can't have a material that's both tough and strong, but um, there is kind of this, this competition between them. So on average, the higher strength the metal is, the lower the toughness, and the lower the toughness, the higher uh, or the lower the strength, the higher the toughness will be. So for a high strength steel, we would have a relatively high KIC <laughs> and a relatively low yield strength. So, uh, or sorry, high, sig high yield strength and low KIC. So here, if I have a KIC that's something like 65, 6, 65 MPA root meters and a yield strength that's something on the order of 1.4 gigapascals, which is a very high strength steel. Um, I can say my fracture process zone now, RP, um, 1 over 2 pi, 65 divided by 1.4 times 10 to the 3 squared which ends up being something like 0 0.3 millimeters. So now in order to do a valid fracture test, I need something parts that are uh, somewhere greater than like 3 millimeters. So like a 10 to 1 ratio. So I need something, this is, this is ballpark, again, engineering approximations. I just need something that's large relative to my to the size of the plastic zone, and large, I'm going to say, is something like 10 to 1. Um, so if I have a part that's greater than 3 millimeters, then I can perform a valid fracture test using LEFM. It's now, I'm going to look at uh, a lower strength steel, so a, a high toughness steel. Tough steel. So for this, I'm going to have a KIC that's something on the order of 180 uh, MPA root meters. So this is about three times as tough as my other material, and a yield strength that's something like 0 0.35 gigapascals, or 350 MPA. Um, and so for this material now, if I plug in, if I want to find out the size of my plastic zone, 1 over 2 pi, 180 over uh, 350 MPA, MPA root meter squared, I get something that's on the order of 4 centimeters. So now, this means in order to perform a valid test, I need something that's greater than 40 centimeters, um, or you know, about a foot across, a little bit more than a foot across, to perform a valid fracture test. So you remember in that uh, the video that I had shown yesterday, they had, they had a compact tension specimen, maybe like yay big, um, and they were doing a, a fracture test on it. 
the size of that specimen, they determined based on approximately, they, they knew approximately what the KIC was, what the yield strength was, and they had a part size that was approximately big enough to perform a valid linear elastic fracture test. Um, but for some of these, say, tough steels, um, you, you might need a part that's on the order of meters across to actually perform a valid test, which <laughs> historically they have actually done for um, particularly naval applications. They would have like giant like meter across beams that they would perform fracture tests on. In most engineering situations, it's not practical, but yeah. So not 40 centimeters is in the direction of that like maximum stress direction yeah, so you would need a part, if you had a crack now, you would need a part that was roughly 40 centimeters, greater than 40 centimeters across from the tip of that crack. So your whole thing could be about 40, but um, yeah. So these you're starting to get into fairly large parts. And with something that's a very fairly high strength steel, you're you're going to need some very specialized equipment to be able to apply that much force to actually cause fracture to happen. Uh, because a f now you need a, a plain stress condition or a plain strain condition, which means not only is it 40 across, 40 this way, it's also probably 40 in the other way. So you just have this giant foot by foot chunk of steel that you're trying to pull apart, which is a little bit ridiculous. But yeah. Um, let's see, have about seven minutes left. Okay, so I'm going to give an example now of a fracture problem. So yesterday I had shown, um, I had given a quick poll everywhere on that R, uh, the R size versus uh, the stress necessary to propagate a crack. Now I'm going to show you an example of a pressure vessel um, and what stress we would need to actually cause failure to happen for that uh, for a thick-walled pressure vessel. Um, so uh, this is uh, an example of the type of numerical problem you might see on the exam, but probably not with pressure vessels because we didn't actually go through pressure vessel theory. Um, first. Uh, what questions do you have on plastic zone size and fracture process zones in, in materials and why we need a certain RP or part size? So just hypothetically beyond that RP value, there's just going to be never plastic deformation? Uh, yeah. Use what it means by like the plastic zone versus yeah, so so what it means now is now the, the size of the plastic zone here, so you want the size of this plastic zone relative to the part size to be small. So basically, so it's mostly the elastic the yeah, so there's going to be some, uh, if you remember that Irwin criteria that um, Ki is equal to uh, square root of Eg this G is that surface energy plus the plastic um, plastic strain energy. I want to try to minimize this plastic strain energy. And so I want the amount of plasticity that's forming in the part to be small relative to the rest of it. Yeah. Okay. Cool. So uh, let's go through an example of a pressure walled, pressure, thick walled pressure vessel. Pressure vessel. So now I'm going to take a pressure vessel, this is like a normal gas tank uh, that you would see in a lab setting. So uh, with some approximated numbers to make analysis easier. So this, I'm gonna say, we have some internal pressure inside this thing, internal pressure P. There's some 
wall thickness T on this part, um, that T is going to be one centimeter. The s radius of this part R is going to be 20 centimeters. Uh, the, I'm going to be using a, a medium toughness steel with a KIC of 56 MPA root meter and uh, my a maximum flaw size of A is say one millimeter. So this, uh, that maximum flaw size I could determine through non-destructive evaluation through that ultrasonic measurement or through x-ray CT uh, to see what the maximum flaws are in there. So I want to find out how much stress this thing can withstand before breaking. So I want to find out, um, find the critical stress that's going to cause failure, which I know is related to that KIC, or I want to find out how much pressure I can put in this. So I want to figure out first how much stress it can take. Um, this is that KIC over square root pi A, which I can plug in to be 56 MPA root meter over square root of pi uh, 10 to the minus 3 for 1 millimeter. And this is about 1,000 MPA or about one gigapascal of stress. Um, so now I can figure out for that pressure vessel what the maximum stresses are for a given pressure. Um, we didn't go through pressure vessel theory in this class, but I, have you seen it in a different class before? I'm pretty sure. Yeah, okay. Um, so I'm gonna throw equations at you that you've probably seen at some point. Um, but the stress now in the axial direction uh, is PR over T. The stress in the transverse direction is PR over 2T, um, which now I, I'm going to say is, I'm going to relate that to my 1000 MPA, my 1000 MPA. Uh, and so now I can say, depending on, technically depending on which orientation my crack is, say if my crack was along this direction or along this direction, um, it would cause failure to nucleate differently depending on, because the stress now is different in this direction and in this direction. Um, so the orientation of the cracks actually does matter for this type of a pressure vessel. Uh, so I can figure out what the maximum allowable pressure is by saying now, uh, moving this over, uh, P equals sigma one uh, T for R, plug stuff in 0 0.01 over 2, 0.2 uh, times a thousand MPA gives me something in the order of 50 MPA of pressure. This is now for <coughs> a horizontal. There we go. This would be for a horizontal crack. I can take, if, if I know I have a crack of one millimeter that's horizontal, um, I could take 50 MPA, or uh, if I had a vertical crack, equals sigma 2t, uh, 2 over r, uh, some more stuff, which is then 100 MPA for a vertical crack. So uh, in practice, most gas cylinders practice uh, cylinders have something on the order of like 15 megapascals of pressure um, for like a, a normal gas tank that you would see in a lab. So these are conservative estimates if you had this type of a, a tank made out of this type of steel with this size flaw you'd definitely be able to survive the pressures inside there. Um, but now, keep in mind, over the years, you're pressurizing and depressurizing these cylinders, which is going to be causing fatigue, and we'll talk about fatigue next week, but that fatigue will then cause these cracks to grow and could potentially lower the maximum stress that you could apply to this material. So, uh, all right, tomorrow we'll talk about Weibull statistics, uh, which is another fun discussion, and it's why you heard all those carbon fibers pinging. Uh, thanks, everyone. See you then.